Hi, this is Sarit Schwetzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your source. Hi, and welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is episode 415 for the 18th of TVs in a regular year. In the past few years, there's been a lot of controversy and talk in the media about the appointment of different Supreme Court justices. And what the controversy is really all about is about the political leanings of the candidates. Because um, to be considered a good and um, trustworthy judge on the panel, you really are supposed to be as politically impartial as you possibly can. You're not supposed to bring your own political leanings into the justice. A good judge is supposed to be somebody who is able to put their political biases aside and really assess, uh, you know, whatever particular uh, case is coming to them impartially and really uh, judge it according to the strict letter of the law. Now, with that being said, we see that this is actually impossible. And hence, you know, there are many um, judges on the Supreme Court. And this is very common practice often to not just have one judge, but to have multiple judges on a panel in a, in a court system and to, to judge different cases. So why is this? If the law is really straightforward and if it's just really, you know, a very logical um, systematized thing, why would you need a judge really at all? Or why would you need multiple judges? You would just need somebody who's like an expert judge to go in and look up exactly the letter of the law and see in any particular case, did the person violate the law? Did they not? To what extent? Blah, 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 right? So we see that this isn't actually the case. Well, this would be nice in theory. This isn't reality. And in reality, the law is actually a lot more nuanced. Now, this is true, whether we're talking about civil law, whether we're talking about state law, federal law, or even as we'll see, Jewish law. There's a lot of nuance. It's literally a situation of a case by case uh, situation where every case is very, very different. And the other thing too, is that as much as we say that, you know, we want the judges to put their biases aside and be as impartial as possible, we all know that this isn't totally practical and that by virtue of being human, everybody has a bias. Every thought we have, every action we take is going to be colored in some way by our biases. Where these biases come from, you know, that's another story. Is it nature, nurture, whatever it is, but we all have them. And it's good to be aware of our biases for sure. Um, and sometimes we can try to overcome them to some extent or another. But at the end of the day, I think it's, it's good to recognize that bias is a part of life. I once had a professor actually at uh, McGill University who brought up this point where he said that a lot of people think that professors are not supposed to have a bias at all. And he said, you know, and then people ask me, like, do I have a bias? And he said, yes, of course I have a bias because everybody does. And you actually should be happy that I have one because otherwise this would be a pretty boring class. What makes information accessible, what makes justice accessible is the fact that it is so personal and that you have somebody coming at it with a personal view, viewpoint. Not to get too off ta tangent, but this is actually uh, kind of how Torah in general works, or to be more specific, Talmudic law that we see. We've spoken about this before on the podcast. You know, you look in the in the Talmud in the Gemara, and there were so many arguments back and forth between the rabbis. If Torah is true, why would there be so many arguments? Why would there be so much back and forth? Because we know that essentially the Torah is open to interpretation. Um, and this isn't a bad thing. In fact, God wanted the Torah to be open to interpretation. God wanted there to be um, 
and various opinions. And as we say, Shivim Panim Torah, 70 faces of the Torah. That being said, all of the caveat is that it's not that this doesn't give like a license to any random Joe Schmo on the street to give their personal opinion about how to keep Shabbos, how to not keep Shabbos. In order to be considered a viable judge, you know, whether we're talking about the Supreme Court or whether we're talking about in the Gemara, you need to have extensive knowledge and you need to be quite an expert. So it's not something that's so simple that everybody can just have an opinion. Not all opinions are created equal, but uh, but there are many opinions and uh, and there's various ways of looking at things and it's not there's not really this one clear cut objective way of looking at reality. So how this applies to today's Tanya and what we're going to be talking about is in terms of the workings of a Benoni. So as we've described, we said that a Benoni, what, who, what is a Benoni? Who is a Benoni? A Benoni is literally translated to mean an intermediate man or woman. And this is somebody who is neither a Tzadik nor a Rasha. So to break this down, this light little review, is that every single one of us is made up of both good and bad impulses. The impulse to do good and the impulse to do not so good. And these impulses are constantly in battle, constantly at odds with one another inside inside of us. When it comes to a tzaddik, however, a tzaddik is somebody who has, who the good inside them has actually won the war. The good inside them has really, truly gotten rid of the negativity, the, the negative impulses to such a point that these negative impulses no longer have a hold over them at all in any way, shape or form. It's as if it, they aren't, they don't exist anymore. We spoke about how there are two general levels of tzaddikim. There are tzaddikim who uh, have truly and and completely eradicated the negative impulses to such a point that these negative impulses actually became transformed into positive impulses. And then we spoke about the level of the tzaddik, which is a lower level than this, which is a tzaddik who hasn't gotten to the point of transforming the negativity within them and totally eradicate and thus totally eradicating it. But for all intents and purposes, they basically have because they've subdued it to such a point that it's not palatable within them anymore. It has absolutely no hold over them, even on an emotional conscious state. It's not it's not a battle the way it is for most people. Then we spoke about the level of the Rasha. The Rasha is somebody who is uh, has this battle going on like everybody else, but unfortunately the negative impulses do win over at times for some to a bigger degree, for some to a lesser degree. So this means that they're not perfect and there are times when they do uh, behave in ways that are less than ideal um, in line with their negative impulses. And then we have this funny category of the Benoni that we've been discussing. So this category of the Benoni is somebody who has this war going on, so they haven't won the war like a Tariq, but yet on the other hand, in a sense, they have won, won the war because they don't actually practically sin. They never, ever sin in thought, speech, or action at all. So all of their external behaviors are totally in line with what God w- wants of them, what God expects of them, what, why they were here, created here on earth. However, they never truly succeed in overcoming that internal battle. So they still have the negative impulses. They still have these desires, these urges to sin. They just are constantly in control of themselves and prevent themselves from doing that. So the question that comes up today that the altar rabbit is going to address is how is this possible? How does the Benini have such control? And how and how ultimately will we see, because this book is is the book of the Benini, Sufficial Benini, which means that the altar rabbit wrote it, wrote it for all of us, um, telling us that we basically all have the potential to reach this level. How do we have the potential to reach this level? And how do we have the potential to do so in a way that is really very accessible to us. The way the altar rabbit described it in the in, in the very beginning as this thing is very near to you. So how? How is it that there can be this constant war going on, this constant battle of the impulses, and the Benoni always, always wins? So the way that we're going to learn this today, and uh, for context, we're beginning chapter 13 of Lugote Amarim. The altar rabbit is going to give us a an image, an imagery for this, an illustration of two judges and a mediating judge. So just like you would have, uh, you know, a judge, uh, a three panel judge, which is actually very common. Same thing here. We actually have three judges and we focus first on two of the judges and we'll see that just like any human judge, these judges actually are very much biased in a certain 
on in in and lean in a certain direction and then we have the third judge who we'll see also leans in a certain direction as well is also biased so who are these judges what are we talking about so the first two judges are these two impulses within the person the the impulse to do good and the impulse to do bad and these two judges both have cases and they bring very strong cases for what the person should do so you know you have like it's sort of like in the cartoons where you have like the two little angels or whatever it is like on the person's shoulder uh and on the let's say on one shoulder then one of the one of the little men <laughs> who are there say hey you know look, look at that person that person looks like they really are in need they really need someone to talk to you go over and talk to them be their friends and then the other uh, man on the other shoulder says oh really do you really want to get sucked into that conversation you know you only got like three hours of sleep last night um, you're really exhausted um, you should probably go home and go to sleep you know your your sleep is really important um, and you know what if that person is sitting there all alone they probably deserve it they probably uh, there's a reason why they don't have any friends you know look at them they look like the type of person who really shouldn't have any friends at all so each one makes a really really strong case so now if that's that case is going on there's this battle so then what ultimately decides what the person is going to do so in comes the third judge and the third judge believe it or not is god and God comes in and decides and gives that gives that extra pull that's going to decide how the person is going to act. And now God is also biased. Which way is God biased toward? God is biased towards the good. And so God wants the person to succeed. God wants the person to do the right thing. So what God does in that case is he pushes the person to ultimately do the right thing. So he gives that that first judge, the judge of goodness, a little bit of a push and makes the case move bent in that in the favor of that and and another way of understanding this is this idea that we've spoken about before of the mind naturally having the ability to rule over the heart so another way to think about this battle is the battle of the mind and the heart there's what the mind says to do which is the seat of the good inclination and then there's what the heart wants to do which is the seat of the negative in inclination and we've all experienced this right like this this battle that we have between what we know the right thing to do but then we feel a different way and uh, and it's this war that's going on so ultimately we have the power to have our minds rule over our heart and that's and that's God giving us that power to do so so let's see how the Alter Rebbe explains all of this uh, and again for context we're in the we're beginning a new chapter chapter 13 and the Alter Rebbe begins and he says that with everything we've been discussing so far and please go back to previous episodes to uh to to review what we've been discussing so far and i also gave a little nice introduction here um, for you to work with so the ultra rapid begins with a citation from the gemara from the gemara in Reisach de brachos page 61b where it says that benonim are judged by both their good and evil inclinations and then after that, the Altar Rebbe brings a citation from Tehillim in uh, Tehillim chapter 109, verse 31, Ki that God stands at the right hand of the poor person to save him from them that judge his soul. And we'll see uh, in the upcoming section that the Altar Rebbe here sees this as a reference to a person. The poor person is, is this person who's battling uh, with these two forces within them and then God comes in and helps him out. So the Altar Rebbe uh, looks at this and he says, okay, going back to this this citation that we brought from the Gemara where it says that Benanim are are judged by both, by both of these, by uh, the good inclination, the negative inclination he points out that it says judged it doesn't say ruled and he says that there's a difference there's a difference between being judged and being ruled by something so that's the difference if we say if we were to say that somebody was ruled by their negative inclination even if this was for a split split second then they would be they would fall into the category of a rasha they would fall into the category of a bad person um, th which is how we described a bad person is somebody who has allowed their negative impulse to rule over them even for a moment but here in the case of a Benoni, it's a Benoni, it's not that the the negativity rules over them it's just that the net the 
negative impulse serves as a judge, acts like a judge. And just like in the case of other justice systems where there's a panel of judges, then it's possible that another g- judge is going to come and give a, a counter ruling. So this isn't like a final thing, you know, this is one judge on a panel of judges. And so indeed, we see that this is the case is that we have this one judge, the Yitzhahara, that comes and like we mentioned, gives their ruling of what they think that the person should do and they should behave in this way that's against God. And then we have the other judge, which is the godly judge, the side of good that says, no, you should actually do the right thing. And then what happens when there's this um, discrepancy between the two judges, The this argument between the two judges, you need a third judge to come and serve as the arbitrator between these two. And so the way this plays out within a person, the ultra really describes this, is he says that um, from where does the Yitzhahara give their judgment, this negative impulse, from the heart, from the left ventricle of the heart, because that's the seat of where it is. And from the heart, then it goes up to the mind. So think about that. So it's like when often when we feel this impulse to do something negative, what happens is we first feel it in our in our uh, heart, in our emotions, like we have this feeling that we want to do something and then we rationalize the feeling, right? So like um, we described, let's say seeing somebody at a party who looks really lonely and you have this feeling, your immediate impulse is not to talk to them. Um, and that's your feeling. And then you rationalize it in all kinds of ways. You say, oh, you know, because like there's, uh, I'm really tired and maybe there's a reason they don't have a lot of friends and things like that, but it started in the emotions, right? But then the other judge, the judge on the side of goodness, the judge that comes from the godly soul, actually starts from the mind and then it goes into the heart. So this is so so think about that also. Like usually when we have this sense of like wanting to do the right thing, it usually originates in the mind. So that's the seat of the the godly soul is we have this thought, oh, you know, I really should go over and to talk to that person. That's the right thing to do. And the more we think about it and the more we meditate upon it, then it actually does start to feel right for us. Our emotions catch up to us when we think about things in the right way. And then we say that the, um, the arbitrator comes in. And then this is what's going to decide how the person is actually going to behave. And in this case, we said that the arbitrator is God and the arbitrator helps out the good inclination. Um, and we and the ultra actually brings a, a proof, proof for this from the Gemara in Kedushin, page 30b, where it says, Il en If God did not help him, he wouldn't be able to overcome it. So meaning to say what the ultra is saying here is that basically it's not as much as yes, we have the power to our mind has the power to rule over our heart. If not for God helping us out, it wouldn't be so simple and we wouldn't win the battle. So we actually need God to help us do the right thing. And this help is a radiance that comes from God over our godly souls to be able to dominate over the foolishness, the folly, and uh, and the Yitzhahara. Uh, and the Altar describes this as like the the uh, superiority of light over darkness, uh, as as we already previously spoke about all already this idea of this this you know you have a dark room and then you shine a little bit of light into it and then the light overpowers the darkness. So that's how God comes in and allows the goodness to prevail. And now the altar is going to conclude the section to, uh, to once again, reiterate why it is, however, that we don't, we can't call the Benoni at Tzadik on why the Benoni does, is not, does not actually become a Tzadik. And this is because the, you know, as much as uh, the ultimate ruling is that they don't behave in a negative manner, the negativity that's found in the left ventricle of their heart is still very strong. And just like it was when the person was born, it, it didn't get any, any less, um, it's just that it's just that it doesn't have rulership over the person so that it doesn't you know translate into action throughout their body and this is only because god is helping this person out um but yet the 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 negativity is still within them they still have these impulses to be able to do it which is why going back to the very beginning of the tanya if you recall we take this oath that we should always uh, think of ourselves as if we are a russia kirasha a person should think of themselves as if they're russia so not that they are a russia we all know that we're not a russia but we we need to have this understanding that we are that uh that we 
are like a Russia because we have that negativity within us and we have that ability, that potential to be a Russia. So this is, again, this idea that came up um, in the very first section of the Tanya where it said, uh, it was quoting the Gemara in Masachat Nida, page 30b, that even if the whole world says to you, Tzadikata, you are a Tariq, you should always see yourself as if you are a Russia. Uh, so not an actual Russia, again, but just like as if you're a Russia. This is the level of a Benoni. This is the level of a is having this self-awareness that even if everybody in the world is telling you that you're so good and wow, look at you, you're doing all these amazing things, you never sin, you never do anything wrong. This could be very true, but yet the person themselves should know that while this might be true, that, they, that they're that they not uh, externally behaving in a negative manner, they still have these negative impulses within them. And the negativity within them is still very, very much strong um, in their left ventricle, just as strong as it was when they were born and it hasn't departed at all. And if anything, not only has it not departed at all and it hasn't weakened at all, it actually has gotten stronger with time uh, the more the person used it through eating and drinking and being involved in this world. So even with a person not sinning where they're not actually doing things in a totally negative way, um, just by virtue of being alive and being involved in physical things like eating and drinking and things like that, those are physical things that actually feed the animal soul, feed the Yitzhahara which makes the Yitzhahara stronger through time, not weaker. So that's the end of the section for today. And so in conclusion, again, this idea of can a judge ever really be impartial? The answer is no. Everybody is biased. Um, that's just how it is, how it works. And so all of us within us, we have these two judges. We have the judge for the side of goodness, the judge for the side of badness. And then thankfully, there's an, an arbitrating judge, which is God. Uh, and so if we really work at this fight and we really work at this battle, we ultimately can overcome the the battle against evil within us but against negative impulses but this is only because god is helping us and god is biased in the side of good as well and so it's sort of like this uh the concluding basically um idea to be to take away with is this idea that we ultimately can gain complete control over our faculties over our thought speech and action but at the same time we also should kind of have this like humility and self-awareness that even if externally we're behaving in the right way, we still do have that neg those negative impulses, that potential to go down. And we always have to keep it in check at all times. So that's it for today. And we'll continue along these lines tomorrow. And I'll speak to you then. Thanks for listening to the It Is Top podcast, hosted by Sarit Switzer. This podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather, Avraham Yitzhak ben Binyamin Cohen of Blessed Memory. Music by Shoshana. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. To find out more about the It Is Taught project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow. And until then, have a great day.